Welcome to Between Data and Risk podcast. Today we'll be talking about continuous education and the lessons that businesses can take away from educational environments with our guest, Paula de Santiago, President and CEO of Borderland Partners and former educator. Stay tuned. If you're a business owner or senior manager, you probably had more than enough about all the wonderful opportunities awaiting you in the era of digitalization. Whether it is big data, cloud, data science, or whatever buzzword is currently trendy. If you would like to hear someone dissecting these claims and showing you what it actually takes to improve business processes, you're in the right place. This is Between Data and Risk, where we discuss real life examples of what works and what doesn't in the world of business operations. Hi. I'm your friendly neighborhood data guy, Dr. Marian Siwiak, and with me is my co-host, Artur Guja, Cognition Shared Solutions Chief Risk and Strategy Officer. Hello. Welcome to this episode of Between Data and Risk. Today we will be talking about the continuous education and the lessons that business can take away from educational environments. We are excited to have with us our guest, Ola de Santiago, President and CEO of Bordland Partners and former educator who will share with us some of her experiences. Uh, hello, Paula. It's a hey, pleasure. Nice I, tell me, uh, because I, to be honest, I would like to clarify: Do you connect your 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 work at the Borderlands with still being educator, or did you give up one for the other? Oh no! Uh, the business that I co-founded with my husband um, builds on my background as an educator uh, for students of all ages. All right. Uh, so let's start with. Uh, question which, in our humble opinion, uh, connects um, education and, and, and business, which is measuring effectiveness, assessing the results. Uh, could you tell us, uh, I know that it's, uh, it was uh, part of your, of your uh, publications and of your educational effort, was assessing uh, the efficiency of the education. Could you tell us uh, what is how, how do you define the success, first of all? How do you success, define the success of educational effort? Sure. Well, first of all, I should tell you, um, uh, thank you for having me here today. Um, and then uh, also, uh, in terms of the kinds of uh, questions that we discuss when it comes to the effectiveness of uh, um, schools and institutions of higher education and other entities that are trusted with um, preparing learners for success is the fact that we're asking the same questions that um, uh, people have been asking for thousands of years. You know, what is worth knowing? Um, what does it mean to know something? And how do we know when we know something? I don't want to get all existential, but really these are the kinds of questions that have been core to the education um, uh, uh, field for um, uh, many, many years. And um, we have defined the answers to these questions over the years in different ways. Um, looking only at the past 50 years, you can see that um, looking at the success in education, and I mean mostly in public school settings, um, has really come down to, um, you know, how do we make sure that we're preparing learners to be successful for the challenges that confront them at the next stage of their lives. Large, largely said, right? So if you're a second grader going into third grade, if you're a middle schooler going into high school, if you're graduating from college and going into the workplace, how can we be certain, or at least um, uh, you know, um, secure in our, in our um, feeling that no matter what confronts you, that we don't understand at this moment, but there will be challenges. How can we be um, reasonably assured that you will have the wherewithal to handle those unexpected challenges? So I think that's really the measure of a successful education. So, so uh, when when we mm, kind of if we transplant this to to, to the business world, uh, because obviously people who either leave high school and go into the the, the workforce, or people who leave university, you know, all sorts of colleges, they, they join the workforce. They, they have to be ready, not for, well, partially they have to be ready for the next step in their education, which is 
less academic and more you know the real world <laughs> and uh, secondly they have to be prepared to 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 still still uh, consume knowledge and and uh, is that do do you think that uh, the the current educational uh, environment uh, especially in US is well suited to prepare people to the to the real world to to to, to business environments well when you speak to business later, leaders they'll tell you very clearly no um you know <laughs> the kinds of experiences that we put in front of young people you know the entering workforce are not the same ones that um allow them to flourish in the workplace um they will say especially when it comes to capacities such as the ability to communicate clearly um to be able to work under pressure and to be able to engage with people who don't share their experiences and background um can be very challenging so um there has been a, a lot of ink spilled about you know the gap between um the education system uh both K12 and higher education because those kids that are coming out of bachelor's degrees and associate's degrees are doing any better um and what the workplace <laughs> demands so i think there's um some very great um uh, uh initiatives going on right now to better connect those um the people in higher education groan just as loudly as a uh, corporate america does for example um at uh the um lack of opportunities to collaborate more closely so i think parties on all sides want to work um better together and for various practical um reasons that doesn't happen nearly as much as it ought to i have a question which we sometimes discuss with with, with my wife i was lecturing for, for for a couple of years myself uh is it really the role of education to prepare you for your working place uh isn't it's a bit philosophical maybe and it doesn't really reflect on our motto what works and what doesn't in the world of business operations but uh when we're talking about education or it wealth or, or or the higher education shouldn't it help us grow as maybe human beings rather than becoming better bots for corporations but or am, am i you know exaggerating and and there is no such a danger because uh i've been working with the technical university in uh in warsaw and we were running a big survey on, on the success of their students of, of of different it was 20 going 20 years back but and there was a lot of discussion about the connection between education and expectation of of uh, employer uh, employers but yeah this is the question that that i want to ask openly like is it really what education should do especially looking how the working let's say expectations change they were expecting us to be in the office eight to you know eight now there is a uh, hybrid work so the communication changes the the interactions change the type of the jobs that we do change but we are still humans so how how to, how to balance these two um i think you're right mary in that there uh is this kind of um tension at one at, at one level and also interaction at another between what um uh public schools and say institutions of higher education ought to do and um a uh, connection with workplaces that are going to be varied right uh different you know students end up in lots of different places and how can a single school or a single educational institution hope to prepare that diversity of kids for success in all of those different um environments well the reality is that they can't at one level they can't hope to cover all of the content that uh somebody will go on to um uh encounter and in fact you know that's not really um a great goal anyway because what a kid leaves school knowing is going to change in 10 years anyway so we don't know what we don't know yet um so it's uh just a a lesson in uh frustration to try to adopt that goal but i think what schools and institutions of learning can do is to feed that flame of curiosity um because what we know about what works in workplaces is that engaged employees stay longer they perform better they're happier um in their work they're better to work with, they're better colleagues and better collaborators. 
So feeding that intense curiosity, that need to keep on learning is uh, 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 an opportunity for any organization, corporate or um, uh, uh, pri uh, uh, public, to um, uh, succeed. I well, think someone should... <laughs> Sorry. Uh, I, I, I think it's an inter interesting concept that, uh, you know, you, you, you mentioned the curiosity because uh, very often when we talk about educational settings, there is there is a great debate about what what is a good teacher and whether a good teacher can engage the, 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 the pupils, the students. And, and actually there is there is talk about how to how to explain to to students why they're learning certain things. You know, so they, they, you know, there's the popular meme that uh, we don't know how to pay our taxes, but we know that the mitochondria is a powerhouse of the cell. <laughs> so, you know, what's what's the point? But then when when people start talking about businesses, they completely forget that businesses, uh, you know, even if, if if people coming out of education, they have this flame of curiosity, the, the business comes in with a big uh, blanket and just goes, Whoa, now you work. <laughs> and uh, it's uh, so there is there is uh, absolutely that uh, it, I think that responsibility on on businesses to to do that. There's another another related concept which I think you also had when we looked through the publications that you you have uh, kind of on your account. Uh, the, the the concept of then gathering accreditations and uh, you know having having as many pieces of papers as as possible without actually the educational content. So people going out uh, uh, into the workforce, they 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 tend to uh, want to have as many lines on their CV as possible for courses they attended, even if they don't know anything about the subject in reality. Have you met this? This have you encountered this kind of mindset? Yes, and actually, um, one of the things that our company Borderland Partners does is we follow the mega trends in our various um, industries. And one of the things that you see shifting powerfully right now in both education and in business is this change in what it means to be ready um, to uh, move forward. Um, it was the case, as you mentioned, Arthur, that um, people rely on their pedigrees, right? I attended this institution for these years and I received this kind of degree and uh, I studied under, you know, so and so, and uh, I'm therefore. Um, based with uh, the wisdom that he or she provided me, right? That that's traditionally how we've uh, kind of set ourselves up to be taken seriously as young uh, and not so young professionals, and that's changing right now. So there's this uncoupling of a degree uh, or success on a particular test as a means to gain access to um, uh, certain things. So, for example, um, in K twelve education. Um, the pandemic has um, put the brakes on uh, one of the um, college entrance exams that used to be taken for granted, the SAT. So all of a sudden, the SAT became um, optional for many students. Um, institutions just uh, weren't paying attention to these scores. And now that kind of has set in in a lot of different places. So all of a sudden, you don't have this measure, this, you know, X number of points out of Y number of points as a means to um, uh, demonstrate your ability to move forward in life. At the same time, in many business settings, um, especially in this uh, recognition of the inequities that are baked into our social structures, um, you have this notion that a degree and holding a degree doesn't necessarily make you um, uh, more likely to be successful in a certain job. So all of a sudden, many organizations and public entities are reassessing their need for degree requirements. So all of a sudden, you don't need a bachelor's degree in order to be able to qualify to hold a job. Instead, folks are looking at the skill sets and capacities that you bring to the table. This opens the question of how do we assess those um, skills and capacities, but it's a very different set of conversation than the, this is my pedigree. Um, and I went to uh, this institution and paid this tuition, so you should hire me, um, that we've been relying on for so long. So this is, I think, again, going back to, to the business environment, because at some point, 
when you want to move forward from one position to another, uh, it's your skills and capacities that should allow you to, to, to progress. Your, your, your education and your alma mater is already way, way behind you. Uh, currently, it's usually based on your manager's opinion and your personal relationship with, uh, with your manager and his manager. So it moves into the field of politicking. Mm -hmm. uh, is there anything from the educational sphere that could be, I don't know, transplanted into businesses to increase the transparency and uh, accuracy of, of somebody's skills and assessment uh, and capa uh, capacities assessment and maybe decrease the politicking potential? Great question, Marianne. Yes, absolutely. And, you know, those organizations um, that are uh, putting the time into becoming uh, intentional learning organizations are those that are setting themselves up to be successful in the future. So um, they need uh, to um, uh, demonstrate their um, commitment to their employees and to their employees continue learning in a lot of different ways. Like you said, they have to map out career paths so that if I enter at some level with a certain uh, uh, skill set or what have you, that's not the skill set that I'll need in five years. So what can the organization put in front of me in terms of assignments that allows me to stretch as a person and stretch in terms of um, what I'm able to do? Um, that's not something, or like you said, that can happen by accident. Um, or it could happen through um, a close relationship with a supervisor just because that's something that you have. But it shouldn't happen by accident or by luck. It should happen um, on a regular basis with more employees. And that requires an organizational commitment. Um, and it requires an organizational mentality too. Because when you put stretch in opportunities in front of folks, Speaking as somebody that has been there, um, you know, sometimes you fall on your face. So what is the tolerance for failure in organizations when they put these new experiences in front of people? Are they willing to um, suffer the consequences when folks screw up and then, you know, have enough of a capacity, uh, organizational capacity to clear up the mess? So it's not just um, learning paths. It's also the uh, organizational culture that needs to be able to um, support folks as they develop these new skill sets. But it requires time, it requires planning, it requires clear pathways, and it requires um, uh, experiences and rewards for those experiences. It's interesting uh, how this all links to an agile mindset, because yeah. obviously, uh, you know, Fail fast and 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 move on is is one of the tenets of of, of agile and uh, it's I I guess uh, if if an organization is still thinking in the the kind of old waterfall terms where okay you want something new we're going to give you this twelve month project and after twelve months if you succeed it's fine if you fail we're in deep trouble. Whereas, uh, you know, an agile organization in this case will probably think okay we'll give you something for three days try it if you succeed then we'll give you something for another three days or maybe six days and you know ease people into it flatten the learning curve this is this is it's it's, it's such an easy concept but I, I i totally agree with you that it does require a certain mindset to to even think about it for 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 certain people right and uh, uh, then from from that i wanted to, to to ask you about the the relationship between on the job learning and mm. sending people to courses because uh i've i've been uh, I've, I've learned a lot on on the job i've been sent by by various companies that i, I used to work for to to courses and uh, usually the the point of the course for me was to demonstrate that i've been there mm. it very rarely gave me any specific skills that I could immediately transplant to, 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 to the workplace. Uh, sometimes, if I were lucky, it gave me pointers on what I should learn myself and research myself to, so that I could be ready for the, for the real world. Have, have, you, have you encountered uh, this, this kind of, and how, how would you, if you were to advise a client company of yours, how, how would you structure on-the-job learning versus classroom learning? 
Well, you're absolutely right, um, Arta, that uh, there are pros and cons associated with um, uh, on-the-job learning and with those kinds of structured courses. On-the-job training um, uh, can be critical for that kind of applied knowledge, not necessarily for that stretch, right? Because on the job is what's in front of you right now, and you can crystallize and focus on it without um, uh, much ambiguity. But what happens next week, or what happens when um, you know a certain uh, piece of equipment uh, is changed, and you have to anticipate um, you know what you need to do next? That's something that on the job training might not be able to prepare you for. That's really where um, more formalized courses tend to uh, do better in terms of opening up your framework um, from the present day, what's in front of you to uh, more multitude of options and um, uh, 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 solutions, right? So you're right that um, in the best case scenario, um, you would have a workplace that combines the two. And there are many instances of companies that have done this, that combine well the of the job training with the courses. But the one thing that they share is what I said before, that intentionality, right? This doesn't happen by accident. It's not something that, you know, you have to raise your hand as an employee and ask for. It's an expectation um, over the next year or so, while you um, are a new uh, to this team or something like that, for uh, three days out of this month, we're going to take you out and you're going to be working with uh, Roberta over here on this uh, initiative or what have you. She'll be your mentor and she'll be taking you to the different plants and showing you around. And then at the end of this um, period, we're going to bring out uh, uh, this online course for you to complete. You'll do it in the, in, uh, over the uh, three-day period um, and then you'll be ready to go on to the next phase or something like that. But it's it's embedded in your daily routine. It's not something that you have to make up, something that you have to hope for and cross your fingers. Or as you say, Marion, that's not something that you have to rely on some kind of um, uh, political acquaintance that you have to um, allow you to have that opportunity, right? It's an expectation for everybody that that's going to happen and not just for the select few that um, know how to work the system or the room. That's Really interesting, and but I just came up with, with a question going st uh, one step back because when you were talking about this preparedness of companies to uh, accept this challenge of, of teaching their employees, uh, you mentioned as well that part of it is allowing them to fail. It falls very much into into Arthur's field because. It's about understanding the risks. If you, you, you need to let people try and fail if they are to learn anything. But the question is if their failure will, you know, pull the whole company down or is it within some, let's say, sandbox, which is... Risk appetite, yeah. Yeah, yeah. it's called re, re, risk appetite, as Arthur knows, and I usually forget. Uh, so... In your experience, are people who are more long-term oriented with these this goals of, of uh, teaching their people, are they also more risk-aware? Like, do these companies, because for many companies, risk is something that you do in a form of Excel, that you just write down your risk and you close it in the in the drawer and not and you don't open it. For some, the risks are like something that they believe and breathe, they understand what what consequences of their actions are. Is there a connection between this um, ability to let people fail and internalization of, of risk management? Yeah, I think there is, um, uh, Marian, I think there is a, a recognition of risk. I think there is a, a healthy disposition to it. I also think that there are some... Um, uh, 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 barriers, or I, I keep thinking of, uh, you know, um, like on a tricycle, you have the training wheels, <laughs> so mm -hmm. that you know, as you learn, you know, if if you fall over, it'll be slowly, um, perhaps, and not a not a total mess. Um, so I think that there are uh, measures that you can put in place to limit the impact of um, consequences, right? 
and knowing what um, uh, those consequences could be is, an, is a set of activities themselves, right? So you um, uh, try to um, uh, allow folks the uh, great uh, uh, learning opportunity of falling flat on their faces, but you do it in a way that um, if that happens, there's at least some kind of tangible benefit for um, the unit, for the uh, uh, business as a whole, um, and uh, you have a plan B in place for um, uh, if uh, this happens. Um, it could be with timelines that you devise. It could be with uh, other team members that are backups or what have you. But you never have the hero going out on a precipice alone to do something, right? There's always <laughs> the, uh, there's always the cast of characters around them that um, are supports and mentors for that person. Uh, but the risk EO, that, uh, that, that uh, cast of characters, as you mentioned before, it has to be uh, it has to be present there. It cannot just appear out of nowhere. The company has to have a culture, and the people have to have the mentality which is supportive. I I had the, the the pleasure of working with many great mentors, and those those were people who went out of their way quite far to make sure that they shared the knowledge. There were there were others who well well not so kind of uh, generously minded and hoarded their knowledge like uh, mm. a dragon on a pile of gold. Uh, so uh, it's it, it's it's not a big stretch of imagination which group of people is better to 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 work with. Uh, but I, I wanted to ask you now about your your consulting practice. Uh, now that you 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 work with with um, professional clients, corporate clients. Uh, First, firstly, uh, you know, do you see uh, that there are any interesting lessons that that could be learned from them? Any interesting pointers towards setting up a company-wide education culture uh, that you, you 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 could share with us, and uh, maybe something that that you yourself uh, advise your 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 customers on uh, that uh, would help businesses because we, we we want to help our, our our audience and what kind of pointers would you, would you, would you share with them if they wanted to actually foster this spirit of curiosity and edu and continuous education in their own in their own organization great question um one of the things that my husband and I decided to do when we established our company borderland partners was to um focus on amplifying uh organizations efforts to improve, um, ideally at scale, because we like it when uh, small, um, meaningful projects uh, grow larger and affect more people um, with greater outcomes. But even the even the smallest projects um, deserve to be uh, looked at and um, uh, studied to make sure that um, they're ready to be brought forward. So. Um, we look at this amplification of impact and how we can do that through better planning, through um, uh, more effective uses of resources, and through the um, uh, focus on um, uh, what ha what's happening and with what um, perceived outcomes uh, or what actual outcomes that matter. Um, so the organizations um, that we partner with are all dedicated to this introspection. Um, and to dedicating resources to making sure that that happens. Um, when we come in, uh, I, I'm a trained evaluator, so that's where I come from. You know, <laughs> I, I look at um, the goals that are established for an, for an initiative, the uh, structures and processes that are put into place, and of course the outcomes that um, result from all of these, um, from the implementation of some kind of change project, some kind of uh, uh, initiative, right? And um, at the beginning, um, uh, our clients understand that the news is not always going to be happy news, right? That sometimes things blow up, things go wrong, um, uh, resources are uh, spent up the wrong way, um, people don't behave in a way that you expect, so they don't do what, <laughs> what you think they're going to do at the beginning. Oh, they and, rarely um, do. <laughs> yeah, we do. We're unpredictable <laughs> creatures, aren't we? Um, so, uh, and you have to nonetheless hold your nose and know that there's going to be a report saying that this happened. 
So I think that's another tolerance, right? That's another organizational characteristic associated with success. This, um, it's, it's not being unafraid because we're all kind of afraid of this, right? But nonetheless, we're open to failure. We're open to the bad news, knowing that we can build on it in ways that um, uh, will help us the next time out. So to answer your um, question, the organizations that we work with are dedicated to that um, try, fail, try again, fail better cycle. Um, and that's the exciting part of our work is being able to provide them with the intelligence that they need to reassess what they're doing, to regroup, to plan better, and to succeed more the next time out. Knowing um, uh, what to do, knowing what not to do, and then um, doing more of those two things um, often, leads, uh, often leads to a great deal of success. It, uh, it, I don't remember whether it was uh, Edison or Ford who said that I, I, I haven't failed. I, I just found a thousand ways that uh, it didn't work. Uh, Edison. I, I think, yeah. So uh, it's, it's, it's that kind of, you know, every, every, every failure is a, is a learning opportunity. However, it's, it's kind of, I, I think in modern business, there's uh, sometimes very little space for that because of the culture of, uh, you know, every, every time we fail, we, we actually, we lose a bit of money. We lose a bit of time. Competitors are ahead of us. What's our share price doing? It's, it's, you know, this, this, this whole thing. So it does take, uh, and uh, I, to I totally understand the, the kind of the mindset that is required to actually step back and say, and say it, is, it is actually valuable. It, there, is, there is value which cannot be translated into the balance sheet. It's value for the people, for the organization, for the culture that uh, is, is fr from, those, uh, from those experiences, right? I have another question because we spoke about preparing people to, to constantly develop. Uh, I wanted to ask, make a step back to, to educational um, experience of, of young people. Is there a way to really set them for this continuous learning, continuous improvement? Because at school, uh, I'm not sure if it works like that in, in the States, it was you had your exams, you had to pass them, and Mm, it was a very strict goal, very well defined piece of knowledge or a task you had to you had to fulfill. So it was very much like you know checklist, not like a big picture that you build in your head and which can grow. It's hard to grow out of the checklist, especially if you have you know your to do list is as long as your as your arm. So isn't there a bit of a tension between what the school expects of people and what we expect them to, to be when they go out of it? You're right, um, Marion, that uh, that um, kind of regimented approach to learning uh, has really um, deep roots. Um, and it, it helps to understand where that came from, I think. And that was from this idea that that was fair, right? That no matter what your background was or what my background was, we had the same expectations in the classroom. We had to pass the same test with the same amount of time um, and with the same uh, resources at our disposal, right? That was fair. I'm sorry, that's, that's, that's my dog in the background. <laughs> um, and I think that there's been a recognition that that, that, that approach um, is uh, uh, shutting off opportunities for many students, that is that a lot of kids, uh, I'm talking about the younger kids right now, younger mm -hmm. learners, they really need to um, be engaged in the daily work in order to be pushed forward or pulled forward, right? And if I assign you little women to read in the classroom and I'm reading it too, my guess is that one of us is going to be really excited about it and the other one isn't. So, you know, so, so this idea that every child reads the same thing um, because that's fair is really going out the window right now. It's a much more tailored approach to learning. And what you're seeing, I think, I think this is a good thing about the pandemic is it's teaching us that this sense of belonging has to take place in school before we can 
really um, uh, participate in the daily routine of, uh, you know, instruction and learning, right? So the sense of belonging, what are the books that are on the shelves? Do they reflect your interest as well as mine? Is there option, is there, uh, are there options for us to choose? I think that that notion of tailoring education as much as possible in a public school setting is starting to be better understood. So to answer your question, I think there's still room in this world for those assessments to take place, especially in publicly funded education, right? Taxpayers ought to know if kids are leaving school able to function at a productive level in society, right? That, that's just a basic covenant that we have as, as, as taxpayers and as a public institution. No, I, uh, it's but, not that but, I'm against uh, assessments. That's uh, just about the, the, the yeah, there is the, this, this structural contradiction rather than I think that people should do whatever they want at school and 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 uh, uh, be you know it learns social responsibility somehow. Yeah, and it's not the case. You know, we don't have a classroom situation where you know anything's taking place at once. Kids are running around carrying scissors and all those other kinds of things, right? It has to be structured, and that's what the responsibility of your teacher, right? Who has the expertise to know where the kid's going to be going next year what they need to do today in order to get to that next level. That's where all of the planning and the structure and the directionality take place. It's not, you know, um, letting a thousand flowers bloom and being happy with that. It's being able to set up this particular child in this content area, area, knowing what they already understand, what their learning gaps are, and how they're going to progress to the next stage. It's it's interesting to hear Marian talk about this this uh, you know how uh, assessment is uh, potentially uh, you know could be improved or whatever after after uh, he moved from UK I remember that uh, you know that uh, he had a lot of uh, uh, very interesting uh, comments uh, to say about the British uh, educational system and how the Slovenian educational system is so much better. Because uh, teachers actually expect, uh, expect, but they, 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 from from what I hear of the stories, they require a bit more even line. Uh, everyone is held, held to the same standard, whereas in UK it's a bit, uh, a, a bit more. It's attempted to be a bit more tailored, and like you say, not everyone has to read Little Women. Some people can. Uh, Although it goes, it goes the other way. Some people can can read a, a simple comic and be uh, held uh, kind of to, esteem. to in in the same in the same esteem as someone who has read Tolkien, right? Uh, so uh, because they both read a book, um, but uh, so uh, it, this it's is kind of, uh, if you if you if you brought it, okay. Let's we have a professional. I want to know the the, the opinion of professional. Uh, there was a director of the, the head, head, head teacher in the school of my children. And whatever they did, whatever the performance they performed, she always went out and said, what an outstanding performance. You, you, you did exceptionally well. And even my 10 years old then, he came to me once and said, our head teacher comes every time and she says that we did exceptionally well. What is exceptional about this one and how, you know, uh, this overpraise was actually a bit. My, my son couldn't understand it. Like over overpraise of everyone and this make feel good uh, approach. He, he he now develops much faster with some 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 whip. Not only you know so much carrots that he's getting you know sick of them. So w w what's your you know attitude towards you know teaching? Is it like a a whip or a stick and a carrot, or is it a carrot and a bigger carrot, or the stick and the bigger stick? <laughs> well, you know, uh, I've I've had uh, many experiences as a classroom teacher, as a parent of uh, some uh, kids that were going through the school system and had various teachers. I I, I have heard that uh, conversation. Oh, everybody's a genius. Everybody's you know uh, uh, just you know outstanding or what have you. And my own opinion is that. Kids smell the fraud, right? They know the inauthenticity of that kind of hollow praise that is um, uh, heaped upon them, whether they uh, made up something that morning 
or whether they spent the last week preparing for it, right? They hear that and it leaves a bad taste in their mouth too, because sometimes they're the sometimes they're the kid that did it the first thing this morning. Sometimes they're the kid that um prepared for the past week. And it's unfair um to use the same yardstick uh, to judge both. What I've learned over the years is that um learners of all ages like to know what exemplary performance looks like. So what does an exemplary um a writer do? Um, what does somebody who's kind of in the middle of becoming a great writer look like? What do they sound like? What do they, uh, uh, how do they read um, when they read like a, an okay author? What does a beginning author look like too? Um, you know, what kind of mistakes do they make? How do they tend to phrase things or what have you? And then giving kids examples at each of those levels so that they can understand, uh, you know, I'm kind of at the raw end of this uh, particular skill set. This is where I can go next. These are the milestones that I can see. And if I really want to be outstanding in this particular area, this is the kind of um, behavior I have to exhibit. These are the kind of characteristics that I need to demonstrate. You can do that whether you're talking about basketball, about playing the tuba, or about uh, identifying birds, right? You can talk about what each uh, phase mm -hmm. of that uh, 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 spectrum of expertise looks like. And when you present that to a kid and when you talk about where their performance is relative to what an outstanding example looks like, that's a much better way to be able to um, uh, give them feedback about where they are right now. Oh, I can see that you're uh, right at your beginning of their journey, you know, if you want to use that kind of language, uh, towards where you want to be. Or you can say, you know, you've really matured from here to here. The next phase for you is to kind of stretch yourself in this direction. That's what kids like to hear, not this hollow yeah. stuff, you know, everyone. And, and that's what adults like to hear, right? It's it's, uh, it's honest feedback and uh, <laughs> you, you cannot go wrong with that at any age. <laughs> you have you have so much to improve. It must be so exciting for you to see so much ahead of you. No, yeah, HSBC, for example, where I spent where I spent uh, you know nine years of my life, they had they had the policy. It was a bit soft to to to, to my liking, but they had the policy that the, what they call the EBI, even better if that they, they you know the, the feedback. It was actually a, a company wide initiative to state state the feedback as it would be even better if you did that. So it 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 was highlighting that there are certain improvement there's always room for improvement if you really want to but uh, yes marian you're not and the ideal you think you are <laughs> uh, and uh, it, so so it's just the way you state it if it's stated in a in an honest open and constructive manner i mean this is a truism it, you know it, every it, it's it's just common sense it's just that we always say that common sense is not that common right uh, uh, so uh, i have another question uh Relating, going back to British education system, because I think it's also connects to what we discussed about the simili similarities and differences between education and real world. And you use the word, the, 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 this dichotomy. Arthur, don't look at me like that. Uh, daughters of our friends from, from the UK, they had like a three week long project. They were, I think, sewing these little cushions where you put needles. Like, you know, this little, little, I'm, I'm not pin sure what the, pin cushions. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, and it was a three week long project where they had to specify the market, uh, you know, uh, they had to decide on the design, they had to prepare the drawing. It was, uh, on one hand, it shows you how the real world projects work, like, you know, the, 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 in a professional capacity. On the other, it's three weeks of deciding on the market for for your for your pin cushion. What's uh, what's your opinion? Is it time well spent by young people, or like because I'm I, honestly I I'm not sure. I cannot say that I that I completely disagree with it. However, I'm it's so different from what I ex uh, experienced that I would like again the opinion of the professional. Is it a good idea or maybe there are some better ways? 
Hmm, that's a great question. Uh, I'm a big fan of project-based learning, which is what you're describing right now. Mm -hmm. um, it requires a lot of time uh, to carry off well. Um, uh, otherwise, it can be that kind of head scratching that uh, that 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 you that you might be feeling. You know, like it just seems a little bit um, uh, useless. Uh, where it's done well, it tends to be hooked to the real world, right? So um, I don't, I don't want, I don't want to, uh, I don't know anything about the pincushion um, uh, example, <laughs> other than what you described. But maybe uh, there's a different way that that can that those same activities can be placed into um, an approach that has something to do with the local community. Maybe the kids get together with uh, some uh, senior citizens who are who tend to be more, you know, uh, with the knitting and all that other stuff. Exactly, so that they're co-constructing um, some kind of a sewing project that's going to go out to someplace else. Maybe they look at recycled material. And where that recycled material comes from, for example, I'm just making this up as I go along. Um, but I love you know, it. There's that that close community basis, and again, that level of authentic authenticity, so that you're not just coming up with a a, a pin cushion, which is is it's not a bad idea, but um, when you look for something that pushes a kid forward to make them think more broadly, it tends to be located outside the school. Um, and not in that classroom and in that close introspection on just this object that um, they're trying to they're trying to put together for themselves. Excellent, but I, 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 I love it. Isn't this the kind of the, the same thinking that some businesses have uh, when they're actually then taking those kids uh, into the job market and interviewing them? Because uh, immediately when I when I when I heard Marian's question, I thought there there are, there are firms that would uh, probably interview a person for a marketing position by asking them to, for example, suggest how you sell a a, a bicycle to a baker, just to uh, kind of th see if they can uh, devise the themes, the 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 the, the kind of uh, a campaign that would sell this seemingly unrelated object. It is it it does. You know, if approached correctly, many ideas. And I, by the way, I love that the ideas where you you you, you connected the, the pincushion to to the environment, uh, to to materials, to the to the community, the people, the, community. Yeah, the, the, I I think certain questions and problems put in front of people, if they're the right people and they're correctly stated questions, they can uh, unlock a great potential for innovation for uh, for um, you know exploration it's just how it that i think the question is about the, the the set and the setting how you actually state the question how you propose the problem and in what environment you you pose the problem because if the person has to then work on it in their free time uh, apart from having a, a pile of everyday garbage to deal with they're probably not going to be that open to experimentation and exploration as if they're actually given the, the, the space to do it, right? You know, what you say is absolutely true, Arthur. And what you see in like the, the organizations that are set up to be successful in creating a learning environment for their employees is one of the biggest gifts they can give is the gift of time. You know, for two hours a week, you're going to work on something that delights you, um, should be related to what you do here, um, broadly speaking. But for those two hours a week, you are going to be able to explore a question that appeals to you. Um, our only requirement is that you share it with your colleagues. Um, you know, after you do these two hours a week for the next um, seven weeks or something like that, and then come together and we'll um, share with each other what we came up with. And that gift of time tends to elevate the um, level of engagement, uh, participation, collaboration, and interest mm -hmm. in the um, unit that you're working with. And it's just an excellent way to demonstrate to people that you know, you're committed to this openness, um, to this uh, exploration of what we ought to be thinking about, not necessarily what we are thinking about as we go through, uh, as you mentioned, you know, with all, all of our tasks on a daily basis. 
I think I, I think that's a, a, a kind of a great summary in in general of 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 a correct approach. I I I just wanted to maybe as a, as a final question, wanted to ask you about your opinion specifically about. Uh, um, entrance interviews or or uh, these kind of in interviewing style uh, where people are uh, you know you, you you normally have a, a division between the the kind of the softer questions uh, of the type of uh, what was the last time you held a contrary opinion or whatever and the technical questions where where people are asked about specific skills and you know that that that, that, that uh, I don't want to say hard questions because it's not about the uh, the the um, level of difficulty, but the, the the concrete question, so to speak. Uh, do you think there is a place in interviews for these kind of almost uh, sideways thinking questions, like what is the number of uh, windows in New York, or uh, th those those kind of uh, is 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 there, you know, people people tend to tout those as as excellent. Uh, um, Excellent questions to talk about uh, creativity, about um, open mind, but then very few people can probably interpret the answers correctly. Do you think there's there's value in for those in in interviews? You know, I think it all depends on the context. I, yeah, the the big the big consulting firms out there, you can think of them as well as I can. They like to they like to think of themselves as the place where the the brightest minds go, and they ask these questions that can appear a little silly sometimes, um, but that seem to have a role in um, uh, looking for people with the right ability to uh, uh, think broadly. Um, I don't know that every interview needs to, um, you know, uh, uh, have uh, questions that challenge people in kind of um, these ways. I think they should be tailored to the particular environment in which you work. Um, that being said, if you are uh, an organization that prides itself on learning, I think a straightforward um, set of questions is just cuts through a lot of the noise, right? Um, we're a learning organization. We expect our uh, employees to come prepared and engaged uh, in their own pursuit of knowledge. Um, how do you do this uh, in your own life, knowing that you have all of these competing um, demands on your time? You know, and just kind of listen to the answer. I think being straightforward is always the, the best way to um, uh, uh, hear somebody um, rather than coming up with, you know, kind of, um, you know, these uh, uh, fantastic uh, uh, questions that don't really bear on uh, the reality of the workplace that you have in front of you. It, it almost sounds to me like you're suggesting that they treat those people as people. That's that's radical. It's much worse, like, like adults. Yeah. <laughs> like adult people. This is yeah. Uh, I, I mean, I, this is this is this is absolutely marvelous. Well, thank you very much for sharing this, uh, and it's it, it's it's very interesting to hear this this connection between uh, you know the educational mindset and uh, and the business mindset. We've had uh, in, in previous episodes se several people who uh, kind of also joined uh, uh, the, these two these two environments in their experience. It's always very interesting to hear how. Uh, uh, you know how how you can actually learn both ways because the business definitely should learn from education, but education should, as you said in the beginning, look at business and look at what's actually what works in the real world rather than uh, have this uh, this slightly slightly fantastic and and uh, maybe stale uh, viewpoint. If people wanted to to learn more about uh, your company, Borderland Partners, um, I'm sure there is a website. Uh, I also know that. Or oh, I think that you're you're running a blog, right? So uh, do you want to share some uh, some contacts that uh, people where people could look for more information? Oh, certainly you can um, uh, always find us at borderland-partners.com. We do have a blog where we talk about uh, some of the trends that we see. I focus on the future of learning and work, so I try to um, talk about that. We also talk about uh, some of the other mega trends that are affecting um, uh, uh, learning and work um, across uh, the world. 
Um, always happy to engage with people um, and share our ideas. So uh, please do visit us. My email address is there as well. So I'm happy to um, uh, uh, engage with folks um, via email, if that makes sense. And I'm also on LinkedIn too. Well, thank you very much. It's It's been an absolute pleasure. Uh, and as always, uh, let's hope it was of use to someone. Thank you for listening. Also, don't miss the next one, where we'll discuss the food industry and the food-related chemical manufacturing with our guest, Keith Wolf, Executive Director at one of the global chemical producers. Subscribe on your favorite podcast platform or visit bdr.show to find out more about future episodes and guests. You can also check out Cognition.llc for more information on Cognition Shared Solutions, our services and other events hosted by us. For now, it's thank you from myself, your friendly neighborhood data guy, Dr. Marian Siwiak, and my co-host, Artur Guja. Thank you. Goodbye.